Matthew number 28, uh, chapter 28, in verse number 18. Jesus has risen from the dead and is giving um, final instructions to his disciples. And I'll be honest, I'm not going to share anything that you haven't heard this morning. Um, there's nothing new under the sun, the Bible says, but sometimes we need to be reminded of things that we already know. It kind of reminds me of the, the, the coach, uh, the, the old coach Vince Lombardi that got his team together, the Packers, and, uh, before a game, and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. We are here to play football, Right? And uh, sometimes we just need to go back to the basics. Well, we're going to go back to the basics this morning and, and of God's Word and be reminded of a truth that we already know and we've already heard. And I pray God ministers to our hearts this morning. Matthew 28 and 18 says this, And Jesus came and said unto them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Boy, that ought to make a shout right there. People say, well, doesn't the devil have authority? The devil has no authority. I didn't say the enemy doesn't have power, but he has no authority. Jesus has all authority. He said, all authority on earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Notice verse 19 again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Is anybody thankful that God loves the nations? God loves you. God loves the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning. God, we're grateful to be tabernacled together with your presence. God, I thank you for every man, lady, boy, and girl that's assembled here this morning. God, I know that you've brought them to this place to speak into their lives, and would you just remind them how much you love them? God, how much that you care for them, how much that you, your eyes are upon them, your ears are open to their cry, and for those that have walked in heavy-hearted, God, that you would allow that burden to be lifted, for those that have walked in sorrowful, that we would find comfort in your presence, and Lord, do, mighty God, what only you can do in this place, God, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done, in Jesus' name, everybody said you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Jesus left us his mission. And, and, and I just want to be honest with you and be transparent this morning. I wonder if anybody in the house of God this morning has ever encountered a similar time as I have. This has been happening more in my life than I would uh, care to let you know. But, but recently I spoke with my wife this morning and, and she's thinking somewhere two to three weeks ago. But is anybody else, I hope some of you other husbands can relate to this. Some of you can kind of identify and understand. I hope I'm not the only one but but there are times that my wife needs something she's making dinner and she sends me she says honey can you go to the store and can you get this and I'll, absolutely I'll, I'll be glad to do that for you and so I drive down to 47th Street Dillon's and I walk into Dillon's and, and I just got one thing to pick up and next thing you know I'm getting distracted that's a good buy on that I need a couple of those and and uh, the ads come out, and I think, I think I'll have one of these. And, and, you know, man, I found some good deals. I went by the clearance section, picked up a few things on sale, and, man, I'm feeling good about myself. I check out, I go home, I got two bags in my hands. But when I get home, the wife says, where's the item I sent you with for? <laughs> listen, I had one thing to get, but listen, look, look up here. I was distracted from the mission. I got distracted, and, and, and I'm being honest, this was really happened like three weeks ago, and, and it's really happened like a couple months ago, and it's really like happened a year ago. This is not something that I'm just making up this morning, but, but here's, if, if I would have just been focused on the mission, I wouldn't have been distracted if I had just went and got the item that my wife needed, but I got into the store and I got distracted. Well, Jesus left the mission for the church in Matthew chapter 28, and if we're not careful, we'll get distracted by good things and we'll forget the mission God's called us to. 
good things. Listen, so, some of the things that I picked up, it's like, man, when Oreo, family size Oreos, you know, the big packs. I'm not talking to you about the small packs. There ain't enough in those, amen. I don't even know why they make small packs of Oreos. It's like, give me the family size double stuffed Oreos, right? But, but when you find those for $2.49 a pack, you got to buy four or five of them, right? I mean, that's God's blessing in your life. And so, but, but those are, they're good things, but you get distracted from the mission. Well, the mission that Jesus gives his church here, there's a twofold mission that Jesus shares with his church, and it's evangelism and discipleship. So God calls this church, everything the church does should be funneled down through the mission. We are to preach the gospel to all the nations. That's evangelism. But then we're to make disciples and we're to baptize all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so everything the church does, notice this, should have a purpose. The pur our purpose should be centered around our mission in either evangelism or discipleship. And if we're not careful, we'll easily drift away and get distracted from our mission. I get distracted from my mission. I had one item to pick up but got distracted by good things and it's easy for the church to get wrapped up in good things and get distracted from what God has really called us to do so this morning I want to look at the church's purpose of discipleship and so there are a couple things that I want to share with you by way of principle uh, as we unpack this number one the first thing if you're taking notes jot this down number one is that Christians are born but disciples are made this is a this is a profound, simple truth, and, and this is something that you need to be able to grasp as a follower of Christ. If you're going to, to be all that God intended for you to be um, as his child, then you need to grasp this principle, that Christians are born, but disciples are made. We know that the Bible teaches us that people are born into the kingdom of God by the Spirit of God. This is what Jesus referred to in John chapter 3. Jesus was dealing with a religious leader. His name was Nicodemus. He came to Jesus by night and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God. No man can do the miracles that you're doing except God be with him. And Jesus looked at that religious man and he says, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is is of the Spirit. And so what Jesus was teaching that religious man is the only way that you get into the kingdom of God is through a spiritual birth. That's it. So when we preach the gospel, stay with me, Christians are born, disciples are made. When we preach the gospel, we're planting and watering seeds and allowing God to give the increase. That's evangelism. That's what evangelism is, is that we are called to evangelize the nations. We are called to preach the gospel so that people can hear the gospel, so they can believe the gospel, they can repent, put their faith in Christ, and to be saved, right? That's what, that's what evangelism is. It's planting and watering seeds. And so God has called us all to preach the gospel. That's, that's ultimately, and, and so... Um, to understand that Christians are born is that when we plant and we water seeds, only God gives the increase. Listen, we cannot save anybody. You cannot force your kids into the kingdom of God. You can't make your children be saved. You can't make your grandchildren be saved except the Spirit draws them, except God saves them. Man can't save you. You can't save yourself. Unless the Lord saves you, you won't be saved. It's a working of God's spirit into the hearts of people. So Christians, those who believe the gospel, repent of their sins, and trust in Christ, they are born of the spirit. So Christians are born, but everything that happens after that is discipleship. Stay with me, okay? So we got Christians are born, they're born of God. God does the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then after that, disciples are not born of God, they're made by man. So disciples, listen, stay, stay with me, disciples are made. This is what Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. So the church, you and I, those who have come to faith in Christ, we have a responsibility. God has given us this responsibility. This is our mission, and we have to be careful that we're not distracted like pastor is in Dillon's. 
right? Because this is what we're to be laser focused on. This is what God has called us to do is to go and make disciples. And so understand this morning, there's a lot of, uh, of classes and a lot of conferences and seminars and, and, and things. And you need to understand, discipleship is more than a program. It's more than a class. It is the process of helping others grow into fully mature followers of Jesus. That's what discipleship is. It's the process of helping others grow into fully mature followers of Christ. Just like a little baby that is born, when they go to the doctor at the six, and they, they get their six-month checkup and everything checks off good, the doctor doesn't give the baby a high five and say, good job, you're doing a good job. The baby's not doing anything. The mom's the one that's responsible for that. Right? The mom's been feeding, the mom's been taking care, and they go back for the 12 month, and they go back for the 18th month. The child doesn't get the credit for it. Why? Because the child is completely dependent upon the mother and the father for everything that they have. If they're going to grow, it's not because of what they do on their own, it's because mom and dad has helped them get to that point. Right? So as new believers, the only way that new believers are going to grow in the grace and the, uh, the knowledge of the Lord is through discipleship. And so the church has a responsibility. This is why God never expects people to come to Jesus and then they just live life on their own. we got to be careful as a church that we're not just trying to get people saved and then say, hey, you know, hope, hope that everything goes well. Hope that you make it on your own. No, this, this is why the church has a responsibility before the Lord. And, and, and there's, a, there's a flip side to this. Understand that as new believers, um, you need the body of Christ. You need the body. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that you can make it on your own and you can serve God on your own and you can study the Bible on your own. Listen, you need the Word of God. You need the people of God. You need the Spirit of God. And commit yourself to the body of Christ. Plant your feet, surrender, and watch what God will do in your life as the process of discipleship takes place. So when Paul... Uh, came to Christ. We preached about Paul, the miracle of conversion, several weeks ago. When Paul came to Christ on the road to Damascus, it was Barnabas that took Paul in and began to disciple him. Can you imagine Barnabas saying, well, Paul is, has come to Christ, and uh, oh, we'll just leave him on his own. We'll just let him take Paul. We'll be able to. Can you imagine if we'd have 13 books in the Bible, if Barnabas didn't spend some time with Paul and, and disciple him? Would we have this mighty missionary that went to Corinth and planted the church of, uh, uh, of Corinth and Ephesus and, and, and the great work that God did. Sometimes we think, well, that was because of Paul. Someone invested into Paul's life. Barnabas came alongside and, and began to make an investment into Paul's life and, and began to be intentional about discipling in him and helping him grow into the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Think about Jesus. We see many times through the scripture Jesus preaching to the multitude, but he poured his life into the twelve. What is, what is God teaching us there? Jesus preaches to the multitude, but he pours his life into the 12. Everybody look right up here. Discipleship never happens in the big setting. It doesn't. You are not being discipled this morning. Let me just make that clear. This is not discipleship. Right? This is corporate worship. This is where we come together, we encourage one another, we worship the Lord, we hear and respond to the word of God. Discipleship happens in the smaller setting. Right? Discipleship happens face to face. Discipleship happens when someone can ask questions. Discipleship happens when someone can confess their sins. When was the last time in a corporate gathering somebody stood up and says, man, I've just been treating my spouse horrible this week. I need prayer, and would you guys hold me accountable? It never happens. But guess what? You get two or three people together, and that stuff starts happening. People start being transparent. People start being vulnerable. Discipleship begins to take place. So Jesus preaches to the multitude. The multitude is important. The corporate gathering is important. But discipleship takes place on this, in the smaller setting. And Jesus pours his life into the 12 disciples and, 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 and shows us the value of discipleship. So the first thing I want you to see is Christians are born, but disciples are made. If you believe it, say amen. The second thing I want you to see about discipleship is this. Healthy disciples make disciples. Shocking, right? I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing stuff right here. Healthy disciples make 
other disciples. Listen to what Paul told young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 2. He says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There is a whole lot right there. And I don't know. I need to, I, I'm going to share that verse again. We need to unpack that because there is a powerful, powerful biblical truth here that we need to grasp and we need to get a hold of when it comes to healthy disciples makes disciples. Listen to what he says. And what you have heard from me. So Paul, writing to Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So let's break that down. First, you have Paul teaching Timothy, okay? So it begins with the Apostle Paul, the elder, teaching the younger. So Paul shares to Timothy. But then he says, what I have entrusted to you, what you've heard from me, entrust to faithful men. So we don't know if that's two. We don't know if that's four. We don't know if that's six. We don't know if that's eight. We don't know if that's ten. But you got Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men. And then the faithful men are to teach others also. See how multiplication takes place in the kingdom? It happens through discipleship. This is how God's church really begins to grow. And this is how God's church really begins to multiply. And so you've got Paul uh, teaching Timothy, you have Timothy teaching faithful men, and then you have all of these faithful men who are also teaching others, and then it just begins to multiply, it begins to grow, and it begins to grow, but it starts, look right up here, it starts with healthy disciples. Unhealthy disciples don't make disciples. Unhealthy disciples live for themselves. Did you know that life is miserable when you live for yourself? There is no purpose, and if everything in the Christian life, let, let, let me just say this, if everything in your Christian life revolves around you, it's time to step off the throne. If you can't worship just because you don't like a certain song, it's time to step off of the throne. Here, I, I got news for you. I don't like every song that's always sung on the radio or on the stage, but guess what? As long as the song's about Jesus, that's what really matters right and I ought to be able to worship and it, and it doesn't matter who's preaching or who's teaching or or who any of that none of that stuff some sometimes we get so wrapped up and go get so centered on ourselves that we need to dethrone self and put Jesus back on the throne again so unhealthy disciples live for themselves but healthy disciples they deny themselves they they are in the business of making other disciples and, and that's what biblical discipleship is it's the key to multiplication of growth in the kingdom of God so once I've been discipled stay with me once I have been discipled I should find someone else that needs to be discipled and invest into their life right isn't that God's expectation? Isn't that what God's desire is? Is once I've come to the place that I've been discipled, it's time for me to disciple someone else. And so this takes intentionality. This takes investment. I love what one, uh, one, one guy shared, and, and uh, I'll just be honest with you, I'm not smart enough to come up with this. So what I'm sharing, if I knew who it was, I'd give him credit for it. But I love it. And this is, it says that every believer needs three different types of people in their lives. Three different types of people. Paul. Barnabas and Timothy so number one every believer needs a Paul in their life that's someone to mentor you there I don't care how long that you've been saved there's always somebody that's able to mentor you the moments you feel like you've gotten to the top you're actually at the bottom in the kingdom you get to the place where well, I don't need anybody to mentor me. You need to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and acknowledge you haven't arrived until you get to heaven. And so you ought to find somebody in your life that can pour into your life. Everybody needs a Paul in their life, right? So you need a Paul, somebody that will mentor you. But you also need a Barnabas. Who's Barnabas? A peer that will encourage you. Somebody that will walk alongside of you, you know, somebody that will speak positivity into your life, somebody that's willing that no matter what you're facing, that somebody will share the truth with you. Why? Because the truth will be what sets you free. Somebody that's going to encourage you, you know, find that person in your life that, that you got a glass that's half empty, but they don't see it as half empty, they see it as half full, Right? And they're going to spend time, that, that is, it's not negative Nancy, it's not Debbie Downer, it's the people that are going to uplift you and encourage you. Everybody needs a Barnabas, somebody that's going to uh, believe in you to give you a second chance again in life, right? So we need a Paul, someone who mentors us. We need a Barnabas, a peer who encourages us, but we also need a Timothy in our lives, someone we can mentor. 
So you need someone who will mentor you, someone who will encourage you, and somebody that you can mentor. Everybody under the sound of my voice should be able to find someone in their lives. Who is your Timothy? Who is it that God has placed in your life that you can help disciple? And understand this morning that God is always strategically placing people in your life. Sometimes we miss it. Why? Because we're distracted from the mission. It's like me walking into Dillon's. I have one thing to buy. This is on sale. Go through the clearance aisle. Man, I, I forgot I need those drinks. And, and by the time I, I forgot what I, I didn't even get, I got home and I didn't have what I went for. Sometimes we're so distracted from the mission that we don't realize that God is already putting the people. We, all we got to do is open up the spiritual eyes and to realize, okay, this is the person God's allowed me to cross paths with who will be my Paul. This is the person that God has put in my life that will be my Barnabas. And this is the person that God has already, he don't have to put someone in my life. God's already put someone in my life that I can mentor. I just need to realize and be focused on the mission that God has for my life. Who is it? Who is it that God has placed in your life? Because healthy disciples make disciples. Unlike Christians who are born, disciples are made. So guess what? That means if the church aren't making disciples, disciples aren't being made. I didn't say people aren't being saved because that's what God does. God's the one who does the regeneration. God's the one who works salvation. That's all on the Lord. But if the church isn't making disciples, disciples aren't being made. And guess what? That's not just the pastor's responsibility, right? This is all of our responsibility before the Lord is to make disciples. And we need to understand, what are some of the ingredients? You know, let's get down to the, back to the basics. What are some of the ingredients uh, for discipleship? Well, number one, we need fellowship. We got to spend time with one another. We need to be face-to-face with one another. If we're going to encourage and we're going to help one another. But, but everybody look right up here. If all you have is fellowship, that's not discipleship, that's friendship. You with me? If all you're doing is just hanging out and talking about what you want to talk about and just hanging out and high-fiving and watching the Chiefs and, and all of that, hey, nothing wrong with having a good time and nothing wrong with friendship, but don't call that discipleship if all you're doing is just talking about stuff. Fellowship's important, but we need fellowship and we need the Word of God. We need the Word of God. You don't need to be, be a biblical scholar to, be, to disciple someone, by the way. You know what you can do? You can take a verse in the Word of God with someone else and unpack that verse. Take less than five minutes and it's been a discipleship moment. Call somebody up on the phone and say, man, what's, the, what's God been doing in your life? What's your favorite verse? Romans 8, 28, well, what is, what's God saying? We know that all things work together for the good to those that love God. And, and, and ask somebody, what is God working together for your good right now? What do you feel like the Lord is doing? In discipleship moments, hey, they don't have to take hours, right? But we need the word of God. Why? Because this is the way that we grow. We're, we're, to, sincere, we're to desire the sincere meal, milk of the word of God, whereby that we may grow and to be fully mature believers in Jesus Christ. So ingredients in discipleship, healthy disciples making disciples, we need fellowship. Guess what? That means we gotta give up some of our time once in a while. We gotta be willing to sacrifice our favorite sitcom once in a while. Well, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. I got my Monday nights lined out, I got my Tuesday nights, I've got, and it's like, man, God couldn't get into our schedule if he wanted to sometimes. We, we are so focused on what we're doing in our life, and, 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 and if the Holy Spirit wanted to nudge in, he's not even welcome sometimes. We've got to be open to the leading and the drawing and the direction of the Lord if we're going to be able to really properly make other disciples. We have to be willing to fellowship, we have to be willing to open the Word of God, and we have to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to take our lives and accomplish what only he can. Because at the end of the day, I can't teach anyone, the Holy Spirit has to teach you. He is the teacher. If you believe it, say amen. So Christians, uh, disciples, if this is our mission, the mission of discipleship, if we're not to be like pastor, distracted in Dylan's, forgetting the one thing that he was supposed to get, we don't want to forget the one thing Jesus left us with. Preaching the gospel, evangelize, and then making disciples. We need to understand Christians are born, but disciples are made. Healthy disciples make disciples. If you believe it, say amen. And last but not least, we need to realize the measurement of discipleship. 
Somewhere along the way, the American church has begun to focus on the number of attendance in attendance as the measure of success for the church. This, is, this has been horrific. There is nothing about the number of people that show up. Listen, there is nothing in the Word of God that measures success in the kingdom of God about how many people that you can get together in the four walls of any building. Nothing. But you wouldn't know that if you go to most pastor conferences. Pastors show up to the conference and the first thing they ask is how many people is attending your church now? The better question asked is not how many people are attending, but how many people are growing in the Lord and are participating in ministry? How many people are, do you have? Because it doesn't matter if you have 3,000. If none of them are growing in the Lord and they're just showing up once a week and attending and they're not growing and they're not serving, they're not giving of themselves and, and they're not maturing and they're not making disciples, it doesn't matter. Listen, that's a social club. That's just a social gathering, right? So we don't measure success of discipleship by the number of people who gather together on a weekly basis, but rather on how many people are engaging in the ministry. The level of engagement, that's, that's what we should be basing success on is the engagement of the people. And think about it, when Jesus came to call the disciples, he never said, attend me. Attend me. He didn't say attend me, he said follow me, right? Now, not that attendance is, it is important because corporate worship, Old Testament, New Testament, there's a place for it. It's a commanded by God. Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So you're doing the first step, but this isn't all there is, right? This is not it. This isn't the end goal. According to the word of God, there is more that the Lord has for us. And so we need to understand that discipleship follows connection, and, and then our connection to the body of Christ reveals whether or not we have been discipled and whether or not we are making disciples. How many of you have ever been to California and, um, and seen sequoia trees? Anybody ever had the opportunity to see the massive giant sequoias? They, they're, they're incredible. Massive. The giant sequoias. I, I did some research as I was thinking about this and about the sequoia trees. And Did you know that the tallest sequoia tree in history ever recorded is 316 feet 316 feet now i think about this now you know when you begin to look up at our ceiling um you know I, i'd have to verify with with jared pastor jared back there but you know he's hung the lights and put up the braces and the speakers and all of that and they get a they get this one man lift in here and it's like i get halfway up i'm feeling woozy chris i know you've helped and and put some stuff up there and 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 Jared is that about 32 feet to the peak 30, 34 feet to the peak of our sea that's way up there that's higher than I'm comfortable with just being honest it's like I'm halfway up I'm feeling woozy get me down and it's like multiply that by 10 that's a giant sequoia tree right I mean you you got to be you got to look way up did you know that the widest recorded sequoia tree is 31.4 feet. You ever seen the pictures of them driving cars through the sequoias? It's incredible. They're so massive. It's like they can cut them out. People are walking through. I mean, you got four-lane highways going through the trees. It's like, wow. It's incredible. The, 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 the heaviest sequoia tree ever recorded is 642 tons. That's how massive these things are. That's how giant that these things are. But what's most mind-boggling about all of that, 316 feet tall, 31.4 feet wide, 642 tons of these trees, but what's most mind-boggling to me is that when you think about the roots of those sequoias, you would think that they would go down 75 and 80 feet, but did you know that sequoias, they only go somewhere between 8 and 10 feet deep? The roots go eight to ten feet deep the power of the root system notice this is that they branch out and they connect to other root systems that's the power of connection they don't need 
150. They don't need to be 150 feet deep. The power is in their connection with other trees. That's where the power is for the churches. When we're connected to other believers, when we are engaged with other believers, don't fall into this lie, I can serve God on my own, I can study on my own, I can live on my own. You need the body of Christ, and the body of Christ needs you. And if we're going to make disciples the way that God has called us to make disciples, we need to be connected to the body of Christ. We need it. I need it. I, I need accountability. You need accountability. I need you. You need me. We just need each other. The sequoias, man, that's powerful. Dan, I would think they, they'd have roots that matching at least what they have there, but that's not. Study it up. Google it. Realize. I think like 16 feet is the deepest root that they've ever found on a sequoia, usually somewhere between 8 and 10 feet deep that they go, but they branch out as far as wide, and the more root systems they can connect to, think about this, the stronger they are. The more people that you connect within the body of Christ, the stronger that you are. Don't listen. The, the devil just wants to isolate you and wants to move you alone and, and, and wants to, to back you off in a corner and make you feel like that, that you don't have any friends and the people don't care for you. And Man, we got to put the lies of the enemy to shame. There is power in connection. The enemy doesn't want you connected with the body because there is power in that. But the measurement of discipleship, whether we're disciple, being discipled or whether that we're discipling others is in our connection. Listen, we can't do it for you, church. As much as we want to, as much as our pastors, we have a vision for the ministry, as much as that we want, want to do this, we can't disciple you if you don't want to be discipled. It's just as simple as that. It's, it's, our desire is to help you, and we want to see you become fully mature followers of Jesus. But if you don't want it, you're not going to get it. But if you want it, we're going to help you get it, right? But you've got to make the effort in. You, you've got to be willing to show up. You've got to be willing to be connected. You've got to be willing to, to make the sacrifices if this is going to happen. And, and the same goes for discipling others. Listen, we can't force you to be a disciple maker. But if you want to be a disciple maker, God will make you a disciple maker. Why? Because that's his plan for your life. That is his purpose. Because the miracle of multiplication begins to take place. When you bring one, and, then, and that person goes and finds one, now you've got three. When those three go and find one, now you've got six. When those six go and find one, then you've got twelve. And the multiplication begins to grow, and it begins to grow. This is how the kingdom of God grows. This is the simple plan. that God, God's economics aren't really, they're, they're, they're not really, you know, su super complicated. It's this idea, go and make disciples. When you make a disciple, that disciple is going to go make a disciple, and then they've grown, and they're going to make a disciple. And the next thing you know is that discipleship is transferring worldwide because God's people are on fire for the Lord. This is what God has called us to do. So my question for you this morning is real simple. As the music team would come, and as we think about the early church, the power of connection, how they were connected to one another, they were discipling one another, they were being discipled. In Acts, Acts chapter 2, we find powerful, powerful truth about God's plan for his people. Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse number 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Notice the power of connection. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the their proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and in breaking their bread in homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, people weren't just being saved on Sundays in the church building. They were being saved day. God was saving people day by day. Why? Because they were preaching the gospel and they were making disciples. Let's go back to Vince Lombardi talking to the Packers. This is a football. Gentlemen, we are here to play football. Let's go back to the pastor and Dylan's. I've got one thing to buy. Oh, I think I need this. That's a great buy. Oh, the ad this week. I forgot about that. I'm, I think I'll get some of these snacks over here and get home, and I forgot my mission. Well, I got distracted. Got distracted. 
Let's don't get distracted from preaching the gospel and making disciples. This is what God has called us to do. Let's pray.